Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. This week, the British three-star general helping to enforce the uneasy armistice between North and South Korea. Lieutenant General Andrew Harrison, Deputy Commander of United Nations Command, tells us it's essential not to lose sight of the potential danger. For me, and I had no, no real concept of this before I came here, you're constantly on a knife edge. So twice during my year and a half, I have genuinely thought, wow, we're going to war. We'll be hearing more from General Harrison and we'll be assessing how the battle lines in Ukraine have changed and why. There's so much focus on the Ukrainian side of this equation. Don't forget that there's a Russian side and uh, there are no Russian soldiers there that want to be there. Sitrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Uh, so, Mike, um, we're seeing this time the first Challenger 2, which looks to have been taken out by enemy action in a war zone. Yes, um, the, there's fairly convincing evidence that that Challenger, it was a Challenger 2, I think, and it was in flames or, or the flames around it and it was abandoned. Um, from our understanding, the crew escaped. It's not clear to me that the tank is completely destroyed. Maybe it is, but it doesn't have to be. It's a big, you know, heavy 70 ton vehicle. So it's always possible that it can be retrieved and maybe repaired. But if it's destroyed, it's destroyed. And certainly it's, it's serving with the 82nd Air Assault Brigade in Ukraine. They're on the front line south of Robertine um, and they uh, are going to lose some, undoubtedly. Uh, this is what we would expect. So this is unsurprising news um, and it rates as the first challenger of its destroyed, the first challenger ever to be destroyed in battle. Thanks, Mike. We'll be returning to Ukraine a little later. But first this. North Korea has launched a missile over Japan, sparking anger in Tokyo. <laughs> The thing that is most worrying is that Kim Jong-un might use this opportunity to ask Mr. Putin to provide him with technology, with advanced technology or know-how for how to build certain weapon systems. North Korea's growing nuclear weapon and missile capabilities and its links with Russia have raised fears about increased tension in the region. It's 70 years since an armistice was signed after hostilities on the peninsula, but North and South Korea have technically been at war ever since and remain locked in a tense relationship. Enforcing the armistice is the work of United Nations Command Korea, which oversees the agreement along the border area. The UK is a member of the US-led UNC. Its deputy commander is Lieutenant General Andrew Harrison. I spoke to him earlier to find out more about enforcing a very fragile status quo. It's quite interesting because most of the people I talk to think it's a, a sort of blue beret wearing United Nations what used to be called uh, Department of Peacekeeping Operation, but it isn't. It, it's a United States-led mission that is mandated by the United Nations Security Council back in 1950. And we are here to enforce the armistice and some other, other parts, but I'm the deputy commander and it's a privilege to be here. And, and you mentioned that, that your job is in part making sure the armistice is upheld. Um, practically, what does that mean? So um, there might be amendments to the armistice as things change. I mean, one could imagine the dynamic uh, issues to do with cyber and space and how does that relate to a modern day armistice. It might be investigating allegations of breaches in the armistice and we coordinate with the neutral nations supervisory commission who they sort of police the armistice it might be working with the unc military armistice commission um, who have a role up there as well coordinating with the ROC forces who populate the southern part of the demilitarized zone the detailed organization of negotiations that might go on between the north and the south in the joint security area and that's really the only fully demilitarized militarized part of the DMZ. It's, you know, hugely complex, hugely interesting. And every week something happens, you know, it might be a forest fire where we have to get helicopters in to put the fire out. It could be one of the millions of unexploded ordnance or IEDs that are up there initiating and causing casualties. It, it could be a potential breach. It could be a defector. I never quite know what I'm going to be dealing with in the morning when the phone goes or in the middle of the night when the phone goes. So um, 
and, and you never quite know what is going to be a simple tactical problem to solve and what is actually going to be something of strategic importance that could explode either literally or or in in the media context into a regional national or global issue sounds like highly sensitive work um, in terms of the the coalition itself how does it what's it like working with that number of nations and how many exactly are involved so there are 17 and they're a, a disparate group because they come from all over the world they're they're core is formed from the 22 that were initially part of that 1950 to 53 war and the seven the 17 who remain come from countries as far afield as thailand uh, the philippines colombia france you, you know a real mix the the five eyes um, all represented in in the in the 17 nations and i, I find it fascinating i've spent much of my life working in in operational coalitions around the world uh, and i was thinking about it the other day 1994 in northern ireland was the last time i worked on a purely sovereign uk operation and since then whether it's been iraq afghanistan sierra leone any any other operation i've been on and there have been many it's been in a coalition of sorts and my last three jobs this job CENTCOM under General McKenzie in uh, Tampa, Florida, and in Kabul under General Miller. I've worked directly to a, an American four-star commander. So I'm pretty f familiar with the with the privilege of working to with our US allies and directly under a, a US four-star general. A major military exercise has just been run, ULCHI, Freedom Shield. Uh, what did that involve and what was the UNC's part in that? Yeah, it's just just a fascinating exercise. It runs in a series of, of sort of slices. The first is the build up to crisis and how do we attempt to de-escalate and get people back around the negotiating table? Um, you know, how how do we judge what's proportional response? Those sorts of questions. Then it moves. Then there's a time jump. More people come in and it switches to the commencement of, of hostilities between the North and the South through a, a scenario that changes on every iteration. And then the third chunk relates to right full scale military operations are underway in the context of a country that uh, is being threatened or being being fighting against a nuclear and chemical armed belligerent. Um, and we work through massive four star level maneuver on a scale that we very, very rarely get the chance to to execute in training in other venues around the world. So is it very visible to the people of South Korea? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it's huge. And it it, it is often seen as as an inflammatory act by North Korea. But actually, it's all about readiness. And you, you know, training is something we, our ability to train in the UK is taken for granted. You know, there might be challenges about noise pollution and, and those sorts of issues. But the ability to conduct exercises is is regarded as a normal part of readiness training. But but here, it, it normally generates some form of reaction from the North, which is unfortunate because that's definitely not the intent. The intent is just to, to prove that we can work together. Uh, and, and actually, that can only be a deterrent to stop us going into a more dangerous scenario. And how does this compare to other roles you've had in your career? Crikey, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, this... For me, and I had no no real concept of this before I came here, you're constantly on a knife edge. So so twice during my year and a half, I have genuinely thought, wow, we're going to war. Oh, really? I, I think that's really difficult to to visualize or understand from from the UK because we have so little understanding of what's happening in Korea. We have so little understanding of the the huge tension that exists between the North and the South. And we consistently refer to 70 years of peace since the armistice, but actually over 700 servicemen and women have died since the end of the war in this, in this conflict uh, on, the, on, the, on the 
from the the south's perspective you know 46 people were killed in the in the chenon um the sinking of the rock ship chenon a couple of years ago you know an island waipido island was shelled by the north again a couple of years ago ieds are planted by the north are still exploding uh, on regular occasions so if you think if one perceives that this is a peaceful scenario for some of the time it is but you're always on that knife edge where one incident could lead to another that could rapidly escalate to to major conflict and and that's that that keeps me awake at night to be honest either either literally because um incidents are occurring or through the concern that something is going to happen you mentioned that there were two occasions where you actually thought sitting on that knife edge that that we might you might be going to war can you tell us more about those incidents? Yeah, I I have to be slightly um, opaque about it, but we have a great indicators and warning system that it, that exists, uh, and it is a very complex environment where interpretation can be misconstrued, where the quality of the munitions that the North are are using is never of the same quality as the UK and US um, allies have. And therefore, accidents continually are happening. And each of those can, as I say, spark a a spiral of um, escalation. And the Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un is not a man who is afraid of prodding the tiger. So if you look at the, the drone flights that that the North put over Seoul in on the 26th of December last year. That was of real significance and elicited a response from the South. And so every incident, one never quite knows where it's going to end up. And so our job is to enforce the armistice and seek to de-escalate back to a stable position of armistice. But because it has never escalated to full-scale war as it was in 1953. There is this impression that it's it's all peaceful, but we're only in armistice. You know, there is no peace treaty. These two countries are still at war. And if you go to the, to the front lines, you see there are men and women in bunkers that you would recognize from Afghanistan and um, uh, and, and Iraq at high readiness with, you know, rifles made ready, staring across the demilitarized zone at North Korean troops, the Korean People's Army. And there is this constant sense of tension and risk that, that exists. It's a surreal place, the demilitarized zone, for lots of complex reasons. It's, it's also a, a really dangerous place from the sort of tactical level all the way up to the strategic risk that exists all the time. We talked on Sick Rub a few weeks ago about how 70 years on, as you say, North and South Korea are still technically at war. It is just an armistice. What kind of mindset do you need for that unique situation? I, I think you have to fight a mindset that tells you it's been peaceful for 70 years, or relatively peaceful for 70 years, so therefore that peace is guaranteed. You know, we use the strap line here, we fight tonight. Um, and and I think you've got to actually think of that and train for that and be prepared for that. And when you travel around Seoul, this amazing city that, you know, is, is just incredible in terms of development and beautiful skyscrapers and, you know, incredible culture, it's easy to forget that only 30 kilometers away, there are thousands of artillery pieces trained on Seoul. It is easy to forget there are hundreds, if not thousands of ballistic missiles that are pointed at, you know, insert the the city of the world because the ranges of these missiles now are intercontinental. It's easy to forget that there have been six nuclear tests of real importance that have occurred and we are anticipating a seventh one. So, So what was a conflict between two countries that may have had regional consequence is now is now an international risk that could very rapidly because of the missile technology have have global consequence. 
Uh, and of course, if you're talking about nuclear capability, you're talking about global consequence that's unimaginable to us in the modern context. And the British commitment to the United Nations Command, it, it's a long-standing one, isn't it? Yeah, uh, we've been here since since the beginning. The relationship that the people of the Republic of Korea have with the UK is based I would say the majority of it is based on that historical relationship from the war. It's fascinating. I, I worked in Imjin Barracks in Gloucester. The Gloucester Regiment fought with great valour uh, in the in the Battle of Imjin. And the Koreans talk about British troops as Gloucesters. Didn't matter whether you came from the artillery or the Middlesex Regiment or whoever it was, even the Navy. They're just re referred to as Gloucesters. Uh, and you know, every Korean over 50 has this incredible um, grateful thanks to the British for what they've done. And mm. m many of the youths, that echoes through the generations so that they still have a, uh, a respect and a love for the British that quite often we don't understand or can't really relate to. But it all goes back to those a thousand, a thousand souls that we left um, we left in the graveyards of of Korea during the war. So um, it was a painful sacrifice, but it it has it has borne rich dividends for the people of Korea in terms of the the peace and prosperity that they've enjoyed for the last seventy years. Good to speak to you, General. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Kate. That was Lieutenant General Andrew Harrison. Uh, Mike, you've been listening to that with me. Uh, what struck you? Yes, I mean, he used the word surreal about the DMZ and the, uh, the demilitarized zone and the armistice line and so on. And it, it reminded me a lot of, of Berlin because mm. Berlin was all, it's all about precedent. Once you've got these frozen lines, then you have to do the same thing all the time. If you miss uh, a procedure, then the other side will say, oh, well, you, that procedure's gone now. You didn't do it. Um, and so it's all about keeping the precedent going of the arrangements that you've made. And of course, Berlin was over 1989, 1990 with Germany reunited. So that's been gone for 33 years. And as you said, this is still ongoing. And although, you know, we think of, we, the public generally thinks of Kim Jong-un as rather comical because he seems to do sort of comical and ridiculous things. He looks like a ridiculous leader. And in many ways he is. But of course, he's a very volatile leader. And I mean, General Harrison's exactly right that, that as, uh, I mean, North Korea is in a state of collapse. Pyongyang isn't because it's maintained uh, very deliberately. But the rest of the place is suffering with periodic real starvation crises and yeah. as the domestic situation gets worse in north korea it's entirely plausible to think that kim jong-un will manufacture foreign crises and even a war in order to keep himself in power and to as it were distract the china's attention and the attention of neighbors from what's really going on in north korea so um, does that uh, perhaps explain these U.S. reports then that North Korea's leader is to meet President Putin to discuss providing arms to Russia? It's part of it, yeah. We know that the North Koreans have already supplied weapons to the Wagner Group. There's a couple of ships left North Korea last year, late last year, with uh, weapons supplies on board. And now it looks as if Putin, having gone to uh, Iran for weapons, he's now going to North Korea for weapons. And, you know, this is the, the leader of a superpower going mm. to two states that he used to regard as clients. And now he's going to them, almost cap in hand, to get weapons off them. And so it, it gives Kim Jong-un, again, a big diplomatic uh, victory out of this, and it diminishes further the status of President Putin in the world. News, discussions and analysis. This is Sitrep. Now, slower than hoped, harder than anyone would like, some of the phrases used a few weeks ago about Ukraine's counteroffensive in the eastern and southern parts of the country. The criticism clearly stung Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba. Criticizing the slow pace of uh, counteroffensive equals to spitting into the face of Ukrainian soldier who sacrifices his life every day. But the tone of the coverage is changing. The think tank, the Institute for the Study of War, based in Washington, has been mapping the battlefield using a mixture of open sources, both Russian and Ukrainian, and commercial remote sensors to build up a picture of what's happening on the ground. George Barros is their geospatial intelligence team lead and Russia analyst. The Ukrainians are currently conducting uh, 
platoon and company sized uh, dismounted infantry attacks to try to needle their way through the Russian field fortifications in the south in Zaporizhia. At the beginning of the counteroffensive, they were attempting to do uh, mechanized breaches, um, also at the platoon and company level, but those didn't go very well because of the extent of Russian landmines. So they've subsequently changed their tactics and are now trying to systematically work their way through through the field fortifications, likely as part of a larger breaching effort so that the Ukrainians can bring their heavy equipment uh, and their mass and get past the lines. And they're making decent progress. Over the last two weeks, they've managed to work their way uh, and reconnoiter past the, the first main uh, defensive layer, which is a, a tank ditch. They've managed to get past Dragon's Teeth, and they're currently fighting for uh, the first main continuous line of Russian uh, fighting positions and trenches. And how would you compare that progress in the south with the east of Ukraine? The main offensive effort that the Ukrainians are undertaking in the east is uh, their continued offensive operations in the vicinity of Bakhmut. Now, that effort has been very important because it's likely a supporting effort, and they've actually pinned a tremendous amount of Russian forces in the Bakhmut area. Specifically, there are elements of two Russian airborne divisions, the 106th and the 98th, which have been fixed in Bakhmut, along as with elements of at least three separate airborne brigades. And that's very important because had the Ukrainians not been conducting these attacks in Bakhmut, those airborne forces would have been free and secure to be able to form a operational reserve that could be used to counterattack and potentially defeat the Ukrainian effort in the south. So we think the Ukrainian objectives here are slightly different in the east and the south, but some people have actually criticized Ukraine's continued attacks on Bakhmut, but it seems to be an operationally sound undertaking given the amount of force they've held up. So how are the Russian forces countering the offensive in the south then? The Russians are leveraging their field fortifications, um, which they've built in depth and they've echeloned in depth. They have a, a lot of depth. They've gone past their own doctrine and they have uh, mined the territory more extensively and more thickly uh, than Russian forces normally would for defensive doctrine. And they've engaged so far in a doctrinally sound uh, tactical defense using what we call elastic defense. That is, when they get pressured too hard, the Russians will fall back out of prepared defensive positions, allow the Ukrainians to advance forward, and then the Russians mount a counterattack to try to regain their territory. And so far, the Russians seemingly have been doing pretty well at this, but at the expense of being attrited, because those counterattacks, of course, are costly. Russia analyst George Barros there. Well, to get a sense of what the current fighting means for the overall balance of forces, I spoke to Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commanding general, U.S. Army Europe and NATO senior mentor for logistics. First of all, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to see continued progress by Ukrainian ground forces, incredible courage, but also their ability to adapt to what's in front of them. And, you know, there's so much focus on the Ukrainian side of this equation don't forget that there's a Russian side to this equation, and uh, there are no Russian soldiers there that want to be there. Their artillery and logistics are being degraded steadily by Ukrainian efforts. And so I'm, I'm reluctant to say, yes, in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, there's going to be this big breakthrough. But it, it does have the feeling, based on all the different reports that we're all seeing, that the potential is there. I don't see many Russian reinforcements that are close by that could address something like that. So that's part of it. But I, I would ask that everybody keep in mind that the ground part that we see is just one part of the counteroffensive. You know, the Ukrainians are doing what we call multi-domain operations, air, land, sea, cyber, special forces, information. There is so much pressure on the Russian general staff right now and the Russian forces because of what Ukraine is doing. And how will the change of season into autumn, do you think, uh, affect things when winter uh, arrives? Well, certainly uh, the Ukrainian general staff, they know the weather there, they know the terrain, they know what happens in the fall uh, when the rains really do begin to have an impact on the traffic ability. So they'll, they'll be thinking about how do they get done as much as they can before they have to adjust to that. But, you know, this is not the 18th century where armies used to go into winter quarters when the weather got bad. They, the last thing they want to do is give Russia any opportunity to rebuild, reconstitute. So I anticipate that wherever they are, come middle of the fall, uh, they will be looking for other ways to keep pressure on the Russians. 
And what are those other ways, do you think? Well, I think we're going to see uh, increasing amounts of uh, drone strikes at targets inside of Russia. Uh, and most importantly, in my humble opinion, the uh, continued strikes on targets inside Crimea, making Crimea untenable for Russian forces. I mean, if you've got precision strike hitting inside Sevastopol every day, the Black Sea Fleet can't sit there. Same thing for the other Russian uh, bases in Crimea. So I, I think they're going to keep up that pressure. You're a senior mentor, mentor for NATO in logistics. What, what equipment and weapons are making a difference on the ground, do you think? Well, uh, on the ground, for sure, uh, they need the uh, equipment that we would use for getting through minefields. I mean, there's a variety of different things that can be used to help clear a path through minefields, and, and we have not provided much of that uh, to them at all. Uh, at the same time, the, the requirement for long-range precision strike is still very uh, significant. If you have long-range precision weapons, you hit headquarters, logistics, artillery. Uh, these are the things that will significantly uh, enhance Ukraine's ability to get through these minefields. General Ben Hodges there. Uh, Mike, what are the biggest challenges for the Ukrainian forces, do you think? Uh, well, they've still got to get past the third element of the Solovikin line, this the third line trenches, and they don't know how strong that is. I mean, they're hoping, and I think there's some evidence of this, that they may be quite weakly held because the Russians are putting most of their power in the first line and they were reinforcing on the first line and counterattacking from the first line. So when the Ukrainians get to the third line, which they will pretty soon now, um, they may find that it breaks more easily than the previous two lines. So they, they'd change their, as George Barris said, they changed their tactics. They mm -hmm. got out of the vehicles and were having to go forward on foot, basically, to deal with these minefields. What they now want to do is get back in their vehicles um, and, and really push through quickly. They want, they want now to go back to manoeuvre warfare. They haven't been able to do that. They hoped and we hoped that they would, but they didn't. But they hope then to get back to manoeuvre warfare f phase and push through quickly. So if they can get uh, south of Orykiv is the place that most matters. And so they're fighting now at uh, Nova Prokopivka and another place called uh, uh, Ocea Tuvale. And they're fighting for the two roads into Tokmak, the 0408 and the 0401. If they take those roads, and I think they will, then they get to Tokmak, and that will be that's the key because that's a road and rail hub south. If they take Tokmak, and again, I think they will, although that will be a tough nut when they get there, then the road is relatively open to Melitopol and south there toward the coast. Whether they'll make it to the coast or not in the next two months, I don't know, but they'll make it far enough to threaten Crimea with artillery and missile strikes. And that will be a considerable military objective. Politically, it might not represent enough, but militarily, it will be quite a big victory for them if they can get to within range of threatening Crimea. Politically, uh, Mike, Ukraine has a new defence minister, Rustem Umarov. Do you think this signals any change in direction? Uh, no, not in uh, in defence terms. Uh, Reznikov was fine as defence minister, but I think the perception was he hadn't done enough about uh, corruption lower down. There was issues about food and uniforms and some of the aid that the military aid that they've been getting. I mean, there's no question that Reznikov was not tainted himself with any corruption scandals. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a sense he hadn't done enough about it and the writing had been on the war for a while. But Reznikov has got a very honourable reputation and he's done a lot for Ukraine since the Maiden revolution years ago. But uh, Umarov is very interesting because he is a he's a telecommunications entrepreneur. He's a very good businessman. He's known to be uh, extremely tough on uh, corruption allegations. He is he's absolutely clean in that respect, and he's a real tough guy. Um, he was in charge of the state property fund before this job for a couple of years, and that was important. And most important of all, he is a Crimean Tartar. He was born yes. in Samarkand. And that sends a message to the Russians because the Tartars have been so victimized by the Russians, Tartars from Crimea. And the fact that that Ukraine has appointed a Tartar to such a key job is a message to the rest of the world, but particularly to the Russian public. Mm. Michael Clark, good to speak to you as ever. Thank you so much for your time. And my thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. We'll be back with another sit rep next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfbs.com slash sit rep, or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. 